You're listening to the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Radio's authority on the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology. Celebrating 25 years of broadcasting. Broadcasting around the world and to the great beyond. All Hit Radio. To the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And welcome back to the X Zone, everyone. I am Rob McConnell, and we're coming to you live and around the world from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Worldwide toll-free, 1-800-610-7035. My email address is xzone at xzoneradiotv.com. On all social media sites, TV, and our main radio website where you can listen to the Exxon, 724-365, www.xzoneradiotv. And that is also the site if your local radio station or your satellite per- programming provider does not yet carry the Exxon www.exoneradiotv.com. My guest this hour is Antonio Paris. He is a professor of astronomy at St. Peter's College in Florida. Additionally, he is an astronaut candidate for Project Possum's suborbital mission supported by NASA's Flight Opportunities Program, the director of the Planetarium and Space Programs at the Museum of Science and Industry, and the chief scientist at the Center for Planetary Science, a science outreach program promoting astronomy, planetary science, and astrophysics to the next generation of space explorers. Professor Paris, moreover, is a 2015 graduate of NASA's Mars Education Program at the Mars Space Flight Center, Arizona State University. And Professor, welcome to the X Zone. Hey, thank you for having me on board. It's great having you. Uh, by the way, I loved your picture uh, uh, when you were at the Arecibo uh, t- radio telescope there. Every time. Oh, yeah, that, yeah. That was, I actually, uh, my parents actually grew up in Utuado, Puerto Rico, which is not even 30 minutes from there. And, and my parents never actually been there mm. and their whole life's been in Puerto Rico. So when I've actually visited and I said, hey, guess where I'm at? They were like, oh, my God, their whole lives they've been there and they never actually visited. So I Look, thought it was pretty cool. That is cool. And, of course, everybody recognizes the Arecibo dish uh, from Contact. Jodie Foster played a uh, – an, what, did, what was she, a scientist, an astrophysicist like yourself? She was an astrophysicist and mostly centered on yeah. SETI work. And speaking about SETI, we've had Seth Shostak on the, on the show a number of times talking about the work they do with SETI. Now, how did a scientist like you – come to studying ufos well it really comes down to this you know as an astronomer i'm mm-hmm. always you know thinking about whether or not there's life in the universe yeah. and i think it was about i don't know close to about eight years ago when i was up living in washington dc i was invited to come over to a mufon meeting a local maryland mufon meeting and so i did you know i wanted to see what it sure. was and i sat down and I was more intrigued about the stories and and how these people would come together and talk about the alleged uh, visitors and UFOs Mm -hmm. and all the reports. And I used to be an actual investigator for the Department of Defense, a credential agent. And I I started to think about how would an investigator actually approach UFO cases. And so what I did was I said, you know what? Uh, I am going to actually join MUFON. And I joined MUFON as an investigator, and I made it all the way up to their 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 star team. Mm-hmm. And I kind of shaped the way cases came. I, I used my background as an investigator, my background as an interviewer. I don't like to use the word interrogator. And, you know, <clears throat> excuse me. Sure. And I investigated cases for about five or six years, mm-hmm. uh, mostly in the Washington, D.C. area, uh, Virginia, and then I decided, you know what, um, MUFON was not for me, not because they're a bad organization, but because I was limited and restricted to cases only in my zip code. Ah. And as a scientist, I said, no, 
if there's a phenomena to this, it's beyond my zip code. And I did basically created my own little investigative team called Area Phenomena, where I recruited four or five people. And for the last four or five years, we've been on occasion looking at specific cases throughout the country. Um, and it's been, it's, it's been a great time. You know, it's, it's been some really interesting cases. We, we've probably done hundreds and hundreds of cases and, um, and we still do cases occasionally. You know, I look at your credentials and I say, you are the real McCoy. Um, <laughs> Thanks. And, and yet, you know, I, I've had people on the show. In fact, I had a lady on the show who was saying that the, you know, she claims to be a, a UFO researcher. She claims mm -hmm. to work with whistleblowers. And she says, you know, Rob, U.S. soldiers really don't go to the Middle East. They go to Mars where they fight with the aliens. <laughs> and I said, well, wait a sec. Hold on here. With all the, all the space travel that has been done to Mars and the great work that people have done getting a robot to Mars, yeah. wouldn't you think that if there was this war on Mars, somebody would know about it? And and she said, well, you know, that's because there's two really there's there's a double basically a double set of books when it comes to the space industry. Yeah. How does the you know like you listen to her and it's like. <laughs> well, here's 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 what it comes down to, and I've I've you're not the first one. I've heard this before. Ninety nine, and I can say point ninety nine and ninety nine cases of of I've investigated, uh, whether it's MUFON or mm -hmm. uh, with every phenomena have just been stories no physical you know well what i'm looking for and i think I, I heard it in your last segment was you need more than a story that's right um and i and i beg to debate there's no such thing as anecdotal evidence there's only anecdotal information out there right and when it comes to this you know i would tell your your, your uh, whatever her name is is it's very hard these days to launch a rocket and a spacecraft without nobody knowing about it. It just does not happen. Okay, these things are massive. Um, the Russians are watching us. The Chinese are watching us. The Koreans are watching us. India's watching us. Mm -hmm. Every technological country that has some type of satellite in orbit knows any time we launch something. So, to and then the payload to get to Mars, it, it, it's not something you can hide. That's right. Uh, so they're great stories mm -hmm. and, you know, and that's what they are. I, I, I'm not here to belittle, belittle her. I understand. Um, I did, I did that I'm on my for own. More than stories. Yeah. No, I did that on my own. I, I took care of that. <laughs> you, you know, it's just like I hear the stories about, uh, astronauts going to another planet, uh, in a project called Serpo and then how there's, uh, there is an extraterrestrial base on the other side of the moon. And then you've even got the former minister of defense and former deputy prime minister of Canada saying that yeah. George Bush nearly caused an intergalactic war when he put weapons of mass destruction on the moon that were capable of shooting the UFOs down. Here's just, here's what it comes down, buddy. You can't win when you're debating with the conspiracy group, that's true. You know, you know, you cannot win because you know, I I'm already part of the conspiracy, whether I wanted to be or not. I, I as soon as I entered the game, they didn't see Professor Paris as a scientist. They saw Antonio Paris, former military intelligence, uh, former DOD at the Pentagon. He's up to something. He is. He is a former man in black. He's here to do. He he's here to do disinformation. Yeah. That was within 24 hours my God. before I even did my first case. So, <laughs> and then and then when it comes to let's go back to your Mars thing, sure. we can debate all day. Well, you can't really get to Mars because it's expensive. It's mm -hmm. a payload. And then you'll get the counter argument. Well, we got there through some portal or some wormhole. Or so no matter what answer you can come up with. <clears throat> The conspiracy theorists will always have something to fall back on. And at the end of the day, I was just on the radio to, to do a disinformation campaign. That's what it comes down to. Yeah. You know, I, I've always, I've it's, all, it's quite I, entertaining, actually. Well, yeah, it is. But what I, what, you know, like I always say that the UF, the, the, con, the conspiracy and cover up is not being perpetrated by the governments of the world or the Vatican. It is the UFO community that is maintaining the conspiracy because without the conspiracy, they would have to provide proof that they don't have. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, you know, everybody say, okay, there, there is proof out there. And I'm like, where is it? Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and 
it's great to have a lot of great stories and it's great to have uh allegedly i like to use the word allegedly mm -hmm. um people that that are that have good credentials yeah you hear once in a while a four-star general yeah. you know saw something a former cia something it's always a deathbed confession a third party confession um Never, there's never somebody really, and it's still a story. I mean, occasionally we have like an astronaut uh, or someone that says they said something strange. But you and I, I think we're in the same same field. We need more than just a story. Exactly. You know, uh, physical evidence yeah. is always, as a scientist or as an investigator, is really what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for stories. Yeah. I see that's all, all I get is three or four hundred stories a month, and. If you look at my criteria on my aerial phenomena website, these are the five things I'm looking for. And 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 someone always says, well, I got the first one. Or I got number three on your list. No one has ever come up to me and said, I've got all five of those criteria. And, and that's what I'm looking for. You know, uh, I'm sure you're aware of the Roswell, New Mexico case. Oh, yeah. Sure. Okay. I'm a former police investigator. Great. So I, I, you know, when it comes to evidence, I take that very seriously. Mm -hmm. And when you're collecting evidence, I take that very seriously. So when you've got Jesse Marcel, a base intelligence officer who goes to the Brazel farm, picks up all this debris, puts it in his vehicle, drives it to the base. No, he doesn't. He drives it to his house. Yeah, wakes up he's his... in evidence already. Exactly. <laughs> and I cannot understand for the life of me why everyone in the UFO community looks at this case as Mecca of the UFO world. I had a similar case uh, about a year, two years ago where, I don't know if you know this story, but allegedly the same week that there was a UFO crash in Roswell, there was also one in San Augustine, um, which is relatively close to there. The story goes that it was two UFOs that crashed. So this guy FedExes me uh, a box full of what appeared to be metallic pieces mm -hmm. of aluminum. And he's swearing to kingdom come. These are actual uh, pieces from the UFO that crashed there. And I'm like, okay, what? I don't care about the story. What is your chain of custody? Well, how did you get this? And who's right. touched this? Apparently, he had this for about 15 years. He's shown it to every single person. Uh, it, it's gone through so many hands and so many conferences and conventions. He's lost track of half of it. Uh, you know, it's out there. And I'm saying this this is this evidence is no good, okay? Um, nevertheless, we actually physically went out there for three days and dug, you know, when my three investigators went out there, we were mm -hmm. digging for three days. We did find more metal and we and we analyzed it and we did our due diligence and we contacted the Air Force and we found serial numbers and it ended up just being a World War II aircraft that crashed there oh in 1947 during a training mission. Well, and, I, and, and I can't. And then get, here, here's the fun sure. part. Well, you're wrong. It, <laughs> no, no, no. You found a plane, but it was a UFO that shot down the plane. You, so you see, I can't win. The conspiracy theories will always uh, uh, one up me, no matter what answer I give them. Tell, tell me, Professor, <laughs> in, in your learned experience, why is there such a need to maintain this conspiracy? Well, you have to you have you have to understand that. Let's go back forty, fifty years ago. The UFO investigation phenomena was a legitimate science. We're talking about the Carl Casens, the legitimate scientists, and government agencies looked at this phenomena uh, because they thought it was a Soviet threat. That you know, during that was basically it. Mm -hmm. That was the the reason for Project Blue Book. That was the reason reason for CIA looking into UFOs. They were not looking for aliens, so. After a decade or two of figuring figuring it out, hey, okay, it's not the Russians. Um, we don't really chase UFOs. Um, the UFO conspiracy group or the community, I like to call it the, the UFO community, had to keep this alive. And, I, and it, it didn't really begin into the mid-70s and 80s where the groups, the, the, the cults, mm -hmm. um, and, and the phenomena exploded into, into what it is today. It's, and then it's coupled with the entertainment industry. Uh, and not to brag, because I love these shows, but when you have stuff like X-Files, all these alien movies, 
all these conspiracy shows that fuel the phenomena, that mm-hmm. fuel these conferences and conventions, it keeps it alive. And and, and that's what's basically, basically is what's been happening for the last, I would say, since the mid-80s. Uh, doesn't that correspond with the insurge of the of the internet? Ex- oh, yeah. It's even, it's even gotten worse, you know. <laughs> yeah, sure. um, with YouTube and, and various websites out there that just post whatever garbage they want. It gets regurgitated in social media. And by the end of the day, you know, the, uh, Russia captured a UFO. And, and that's the headline. Nobody's looking for proof. You've got a couple of cheesy videos that, you know, perhaps might have been modified with, with, with some software. But you would think if, if this was legitimate stuff, it would be on legitimate outlets, right? Exactly. You know. And I'm not, I'm not picking and choosing you which one's best, but you know, CNN, Fox News, all these, uh, all these world class yeah. newspapers would would be printing this stuff. But when they do print it, notice it's always in the entertainment section or the goofy section of, you know, man captures image of UFO, mm-hmm. you know, stealing a cow, and it's and the media portrays it as something funny or comical, not not something serious. What about cases like the Phoenix Lights? What's your take on that? I like the Phoenix case because of it. Uh, it's basically two separate events. Okay, uh, during that week phase, we, as far as I can, all the data I've seen and my little investigations I've seen, there were two basically two separate events. You had the Air Force, I think it was Air Force Reserves or something, uh, testing the flares. National Guard, the then, Maryland National Guard. Yeah, but Guard. then you know towns down like miles away from there saw something that looks like nothing like flares it's black a a massive black triangle um that you know there was a lot of credible people like news media um uh police officers and things like that that know the difference between flares and a moving object so it's a really good case it's a really good case um it's unidentified it's it's an unidentified case, uh, and it's going to be unidentified. I can't speculate that it's aliens. Could it, it could it be? And I can't speculate that it's military uh, R and D either. It, so that's that's the uh, the conundrum. That's the classic definition of uh, something unidentified. We we don't know what it is. In, in your opinion, what is the <clears throat> most uh, compelling case that you mm-hmm. and your people have investigated? There's been a couple, and I think one of my favorite cases uh, was, let's see, about two and a half, yeah, maybe just under, about two years ago, and I'll I'll try to protect some names here because sure. that's what we do. So we that. had a, uh, a, uh, a vice president of IBM who invited me over to his house, big guy, mm-hmm. you know, I'm like, wow, massive mansion, and told me uh, – a, a nice story. So, and I'm I'm gauging the guy. You know, I'm a trained in, interrogator. Mm-hmm. I'm looking for for signs that this guy's BSing me. Nevertheless, so he tells me that one day he was driving, and he was watching Washington D.C. towards Camp David, and his car just stopped uh, on his way to Gaithersburg, and he can see the stop sign. Not too far away, but he, he the stop sign was illuminated. It's almost like the, the movie. And as he got out, he looked on top of him, and less than 100 feet hovering above him was a massive black triangle. Mm-hmm. And he estimated it about the size of two football fields. And just the details that he gave me, you know, he said right. um, he can hear slight hum. He can feel slight uh, warmth. Uh, he... You know, all the, uh, like a grading system under what he thought might have been a propulsion. You know, this guy's smart. He's got a PhD. Right. And one of the first questions I asked him is, dude, why didn't you take a photo? And he said, basically, he could not move. Like, all he can think about was, I need to grab my iPhone um, and take a fit. And basically, he could not move. He wouldn't use the word that he was frozen or something was, was holding him down, but that all he can think about, I need to get the phone. I can see it in the, in the little cubby in the car, but something prevented him from actually going back in the car. And then when it, when the thing left, he, uh, he couldn't get the car started for about an hour. His phone wouldn't turn on for about an hour. 
and then finally uh, everything went to normal. So I thought it was a you know a guy, and I did a background check on this guy. Uh, did multiple interviews, three or four interviews with him. Gave me a nice sketch, and I thought it was a great story. Um, he had he had nothing to gain, nothing to lose. Good educated guy, good credentials, but you know, at the end of the day, it's just it's just another great story. No, no real physical evidence. That's always the case, isn't it? But I'm sorry. That seems to be always the case. There's never any physical evidence, brother. When you are dealing with uh, the UFO phenomena, mm. it's it's basically like the Bigfoot phenomena, the Chupacabra phenomena. It's I saw something, um, and. And it's, you know, we, we actually did an analysis. The the uh, the amount of time that somebody physically sees a UFO out of the hundreds of cases I did, we narrowed it down. Uh, it's about two to three seconds. So that's not a lot of time for someone to physically pick up a phone or a camera, turn it on, get it focused, and take an image. So it's always something they look up in the sky they see something for two or three seconds, and then it's gone. I, I don't think I've ever seen a case where they're just standing there for half an hour looking at it and taking images. What about the uh, what about the other cases that, that are out there? Uh, you know, like Tunguska. People think that, oh, that has to have been a UFO crash. And, and yet scientists have said it was a comet or a meteor. Yeah, initially they thought it was a meteor, and but I think the consensus now is uh, that it was a comet that evaporated uh, in the lower atmosphere, and I, you know, I, basically that's what it is. Uh, I really, yeah, I've heard the stories. It could have been a UFO. I heard it could have been a portal that opened up. Um, so, but you know, I stick to the science. Scientists went out there, physically mm-hmm. did their analysis, did their data testing, did their spectral analysis of all the stuff they found and it turned out to be a comet the the ufo community if it wants it to be a, a ufo they need to go out there and do the testing you just can't speculate in your opinion what is the the searching for life in the universe for example let's take seti as a, as an astronomer yourself yeah. and a scientist what do you think of the way that seti is proceeding you know there's a great analogy that uh i guess i guess analogy that i always like to use is that um, looking for alien radio waves is analogous to like looking for a galaxy with good Chinese food. We 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 tend to think that other civilizations, or let's just use the word life life in the universe, mm-hmm. um, evolved the same way humans did. Um, you and I exist, and you and I are talking over this radio because humans evolved with ten digits, and they invented math using ten base. And it goes on and on. We were able to invent technology, radios. So everything you see around you, whether it's the donut that you're eating, the laptop you're using today, was based on human evolution and your 10 fingers. Basically, that's what it comes down to. So for another civilization and life in the universe to evolve basically the same we did and to discover radio um, is a really, really low probability. And even if I was to say, okay, there's a 1% chance out of the trillion that life did evolve the same way we did and that they discovered and used radio the same we do, um, they would have to be relatively close for us to already hear them. You know, seti has been doing this for about 30, 40 years now, and that would mean we should have heard something, you know, a long time ago. So it's it's looking for radio signals. I don't think would probably be the best way for us to use our budgets. Um, and then distances. Radio signals are like your Wi-Fi signal, right? In your house, you got a great great signal. Mm-hmm. Once you go to take the trash out, you lose three or four bars, right? Yeah. And once you go across, you know, once they pass Jupiter, it gets smaller and smaller. Once they go out about a hundred light years, we basically lost our Wi-Fi signal, and the radio signals that we emitted about 100 years ago have basically become uh, background noise. So there have to just, there has to be a civilization with a, with about, eh, I say about 100 light years around Earth for them to actually detect us. And the same would be backwards. If, a, if, a, if an intelligent life is using radio signals like us, it would only go out so far before it's indistinguishable from background radiation. 
So who knows what's out there? Other people have speculated, well, they could be using light, which mm-hmm. is okay. I think light is better or, or high gamma ray bursts or something that's stronger that can, you know, and won't lose its, uh, its strength as it travels through the interstellar medium. All right, stand by, Professor. You and I have to take a short commercial break. At the bottom of the hour, Exonation Professor Antonio Paris is our guest. www.planetary-science.org and aerial-phenomenon.org. This is the Exon. I am Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, on the Exon Broadcast Network, Talk Star Radio Network, and Radio X in Europe. Strange days, strange topics. But you know what? I want to believe. But I want proof. I don't want hearsay. I don't want third-hand information. I want proof. We deserve it. We demand it. And if it's not there, I'm sorry, I don't accept it. You know, Judge Judy says, if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, and walks like a duck, it's a duck. I want proof, gang. Get me the proof. I'll be back on the other side of the short break as we continue here in the Exome from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. Listening to the X Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Know the secret to everything? Well, then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting edge breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money and abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. Just go to secrettoeverything.com forward slash XZone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free. Annie Callahan, dedicated to negotiating a position for Earth within the Daggeronian Coalition, had trained for three years to become an Earth ambassador. Yet, the very eve of her arrival at the capital ruling planet, she is claimed as destined mate to an oversized, mating maddened vamp who swears he will never release her. Lord Azteran, king of the Macian sector, has waited over 900 years for his destined mate. Having found her as an alpha vamp, he is unable to relinquish Annie, virtually holding her hostage until he can claim her. Yet Macians cannot survive without their mate's love. How could he strip her of her citizenship, her ambassadorship, and her freedom and expect to win her heart? With All That I Am by Kahira O'Donnell is the latest book in this exciting series, The Daggeronian Chronicles, guaranteed to keep readers coming back for more. With All That I Am by Kahira O'Donnell is available on Amazon.com and KahiraO'Donnell.com. Little children aren't the only ones afraid of the dark. Millions of soldiers return from war zones with PTSD, anger, frustration, fear, and loneliness, much of which surfaces during the darkness of the night. You have the chance to change the lives of these American heroes. Songs and Stories for Soldiers.us provides free MP3 players for these men and women. With a list of 3 million songs in 16 different styles, 100,000 audiobooks, and 30,000 old-time radio programs, every veteran can find something to soothe and comfort them at no cost. All our players contain an 8-hour audio program designed to help veterans fall asleep. With 1,500 plus vets now participating, it's our goal to deliver 10,000 audio players this year. Go to our website at songsandstoriesforsoldiers.us. 
help us help a veteran make it through the night. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Welcome back, everyone. Professor Antonio Paris is our guest. He is a former U.S. Army intelligence officer, infantry officer, paratrooper, and was awarded a Bronze Star Medal for Valor in Iraq. He is also the author of two books, Aerial Phenomenon and Space Science. He is a certified Patty Scuba instructor and dive master and is a professional member of, of the Washington Academy of Sciences and the American Astronomical Society. His website is www.planetary-science.org and aerial-phenomenon.org. When you go out to do an investigation at an alleged site, um, Professor, what equipment do you take? Well, it actually depends on what what the case is. Um, Most cases tend to be just an interview and, you know, laptop, notepad, piece of paper, maybe a camera and a tape recorder. Mm -hmm. And I would say maybe out of every 50 cases, there's uh, what we call a close encounter case where either there was a type of landing, um, some type of uh, alleged uh, uh, leftover trace evidence of a landing so we have a really nice uh, toolkit. Uh, it involves everything from a uh, modern Geiger counter, uh, met, you know, um, radiation detectors and things like that, high-speed cameras, night vision goggles, thermal uh, goggles and things like that, and evidence collection kit, uh, so things like that. But rarely we do we use that. You know, we've only had about two cases that were considered a close encounter case where we actually brought the equipment – we secured the area. We, we closed it off, uh, and we did some testing with whether it was a Geiger counter, metal detector, mm-hmm. uh, some sample analysis. Take them to the the labs. They'll do some testing. So that's only happening actually twice. Most cases tend not to be uh, close encounters, unless it's an alleged abduction. Normally, that's just a sit down. Most uh, alleged abductions. Uh, there's no trace evidence. How do you ex- how do you explain a, a, an alleged alien abduction? This is where you have to be careful, and I and I and I've trained my investigators to handle these cases very careful because I am not a psychiatrist. Mm-hmm. My investigators are not psychiatrists, and this is only because of all the of all the alleged cases. And that, I can only speak for the cases I've done. Right. The cases that we've had, and I'd say we probably did about 40, maybe close already, 40, 50 alleged abductions, the witness tends to be a very unstable person. We've had cases that people want to commit suicide. We've had people that are very belligerent and angry. We have people that claim they've been raped, abducted, all the things that as an investigator, you're an investigator, right? If someone came to you and said, I've been... And I like to use these words. I've been kidnapped. Mm-hmm. I've been raped. Mm-hmm. I've been hurt. Mm-hmm. That to me is a crime. It Whether is. Whether it's aliens yep. or it's not aliens. Definitely. And I, tell, and I tell my guys, be careful with these cases. Mm-hmm. And all the legitimate ones that I think these people need help, I've always referred them to a psychiatrist. Right. It's, it's very dangerous. And, and it really pees me off that we got all these wannabe UFO investigators out there playing psychiatrists, playing hypnotherapists. And making things for the for the witness. They're My responsibility with fire. is to take the information mm-hmm. and tell the person, "Listen, I have someone that you can speak with. He is a he is a he is a licensed yeah. doctor. Please tell him your story because we've had one case where the guy literally called us at like three in the morning saying mm-hmm. he was going to shoot himself in the head yeah. because the aliens were coming. And I said, "Sir, just calm down." I called the police, uh, and the police came over, and they took care of it for me. So we have to be careful of those cases. The last thing I need is a cop knocking on my door. Hey, this guy killed someone or did something. He was the last person. You were the last person he spoke to. 
So we tend to not do that many abduction cases anymore. We take the information mm -hmm. and then we – and if if it's serious enough, we'll pass it on. If we think the guy's just BSing us, we don't even open a case. So a, a note to the people listening out there, please be careful. You might do more damage than actually helping the person who actually needs help. So you have to be careful. It's as if some people use the UFO phenomenon as well as the – uh, the alien abduction scenario, or even ghost hunting. I've seen it all. Of, I've seen you know, it. It, it, I, it seems they, that now, they want attention. Now they have. Now they have. If you go to these UFO conferences, mm -hmm. they have like special sessions just for abductees. And by the way, you have to pay an extra fee if you want to sit in there. Of course. Um, and it's like it's like what do they, what do they call those when people get together and I'm an alcoholic and I'm a, you know oh yeah those, like those, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous yeah so yeah. now they have the Abductions Anonymous where they and I've sat in a couple of these for research and mm -hmm. it's they're feeding each others against each other's emotions and stories and just making the thing worse um, and I'm like okay why are you seeing a psychiatrist or a doctor oh I am seeing one he's a trained UFO you know move oh, yeah. on investigator who got his hypnosis certificate on, on the internet and I'm like. Oh my God! <laughs> you know this. It's it's sad because I think these some of these people do need legitimate help. I'm not yeah. saying they're crazy. Maybe they were abducted, but you don't. You got to see someone who's qualified to to do this kind of stuff. Do you think that extraterrestrials are really coming from other planets and abducting Earthlings? I don't think so, yeah. and that's just my opinion. If I okay. was an sure. alien. If, if 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 I was an extraterrestrial and I first let's say came to Earth clandestinely just to check things out, and I abducted a couple of specimens for for research, at what point do you conclude your scientific inquiry? All right, if these aliens traveled millions of miles, whether by spacecraft or by wormholes or by interdimensional. They've been abducting us for about 50, 60 years now. That's poor science. At what point do you, do you have enough data and say, I concluded my data on human species. Uh, so as a scientist, it's, it's poor data collection on their behalf. You don't need thousands and thousands of, of abductions to study us because people are saying, oh, they're here to study us. Really? For 50 years? Give me mm -hmm. a break. Who's, who's running their budget? You know, <laughs> at what point do you say, where's, where's my report? So, you know, Aliens coming in tin cans, traveling for perhaps thousands and millions of years, if they, <clears throat> unless they found some way to travel faster than light. I don't really buy that. I, I, I prefer to for I, I prefer the conspiracy theory model where it's the military perhaps abducting us or used to abduct us for experiments rather than some alien species from a different star system. Ever notice it's never a homeless person that gets abducted. <sighs> Um, I don't think I've ever any had a yeah. homeless abduction. I'm sure they're out there, but I've never had one. Yeah, I, I've never heard of one. It no, seems I've... it seems that there's someone, you know, is a desolate highway, like in the Betty and Barney Hill case. Um, and then you've got, let me see, Travis Walton, Fire in the Sky. There was another. Yeah. You know, if, Travis is an actual pretty good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And I meet him at the conferences all the time. Yep. And we talk over the phone and emails. And I told him one day, listen, buddy, you have a really good story. I told him about a year and a half ago, we met in Ozark. And I right. said, you have a really great story. And and he and he tells me, Antonio, I know. I really wish I had the physical evidence. But all I have is a good story. And I kind of bonded with him because he he was straight up with me. And, and I feel that it's been the UFO community um, that's been shaping his story and invited him to keep going to these yep. stories, to these things. So it's almost, it's back to that abduction case. He's been, it's them, the let, community let, that wants to keep this story alive. Let me put it this way. What the UFO community has done with Travis Walton and others <clears throat> out there is they pimp them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They're a way of these different uh, conferences, these different uh, seminars, these different exhibitions to, to draw people in. You know, it's 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 sad. It is really sad. And when I hear people say, "Well, you know, there, there's well, no, now there's... they have like the UFO Oscars. Have you seen that? Yeah. They actually give out trophies to like the best, you know, and, uh, the best witnesses and, and abductees. Mm -hmm. And so it's 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 
it's growing into this industry, entertainment industry, where now they give out awards and UFO Oscars and all that stuff. Oh, yeah, but you see, you speak to anyone <laughs> within the UFO community, and they will be the first ones to say, well, we never make any money. It costs us money to do what we're doing. We volunteer our time. I, I totally understand that. Yeah. And any any nonprofit, including MUFON, that's – that's the side of business. You know, if you want to keep something alive and you want to hold a conference, you have to charge someone exactly. whether it's a big conference. But they need – you know, if, if they were rotating the, the guests, I think that would be kind of cool. But I've been to enough conferences mm-hmm. now where it's it's the same people. Stanton Freeman. Oh, my God. Travis Walton. Yeah. Betty Barney Hill's daughter. Kate Marlene, I think her name is. And it's basically regurgitating – It's You've got four or five major conferences a year, yeah. the big ones, and six or seven little ones, and, and they there. just they just hop from each one to another, do their circuit, and then the circuit starts again. And you know, it's it's a career for them, for the yeah. speakers. It is, right? And 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 uh, or part time job, whatever you want to call it. And then it's uh, it's you know, it's like inviting Arnold Schwarzenegger to every Comic Con, right? Yeah. You have a big speaker that that you think that cult has captivated themselves with and that's what they're doing you know and and i i've noticed that as these guys unfortunately are passing on they're they're, they're you know they're, they're getting old they're mm-hmm. dying they're having difficulty finding the next generation of speakers and they, they they've what they've done is if you go to these conferences now is basically it's becoming conspiracies now they're, they're inviting people that do conspiracy books uh the one you know just like the what the you know the aliens battle up in Mars and, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. So now they're wooing the people with with conspiracies, which I think it's bad. It's marketing. Plain and exactly. simple, it is marketing. Listen, uh, I'd like to ask you about you recently published a paper suggesting comets were responsible for the wow signal. Can yeah. You, can you mm-hmm. elaborate on that, please? First of all, tell our listeners what the wow signal was. So back in 1977, uh, when SETI basically started uh, looking for life in the universe, and in this case, uh, radio signals, uh, the bigger telescope in Ohio detected uh, what appeared to be a signal. And in that case, it was a, a it fell into the hydrogen line. And it was a really nice, strong signal. And it's been basically not identified ever since then. So, you know. Mm-hmm. So SETI has kind of shaped their – I don't want to say they shaped their existence behind this, but for the, for the 15 years afterwards, that is basically was the premise of their existence. We found something. We've never detected it before. Um, we need the funding, and, and SETI grew and grew. But basically, they dropped that signal. It became a really cool organization in and itself. And some some uh, scientists have have tried different ways to identify the signal back in the eighties and nineties, and I think two thousand six was the last one. So um, I think it was about five or no, about six months ago, I was having a talk with my colleague Evan, Dr. Evan Davies, up in Washington, and the topic came up. And basically, I looked. I was we were driving up the the, the highway, and a car was kind of driving in the overpass really fast. And I said to myself, you know what? What if something passed in front of the bigger rate of telescope and passed through just one horn and it was able to come down in some type of angular momentum, like more of an angle, and miss the second horn? And so I started doing some research and and I went to JPL's websites and NASA's websites and, and said to myself, what could emit hydrogen uh and i found a lot of old papers and some recent ones that comets do comets can emit hydrogen through the uh h1 line but no there was no information about comets being in that area until i did some research on jpl's uh asteroid database Mm -hmm. and i said let me plug in these numbers and I started plugging in some right of session declination values where that's basically the grid zone of the wow signal. And then I entered the date and the, the exact date and time. And then I started doing some comet research. And I said, wait a minute. I found two comets that were discovered after 2006, so years after the, the SETI research. 
uh, wow signal. And I said, wait a minute. So we have two comets in the same, basically the same spot. So that's already an astronomical, you know, coincidence. Um, and so I did research on the two comets, uh, and, and then I did some more research on if comets can have large hydrogen envelopes, can they emit the radio signal? So this is what it's come down to. You're a detective, right? Former police officer. Yeah. I have an incident that happened on this date and this time. Mm-hmm. That's the radio signal, right? Yep. Guess what? On this day and time, I have two suspects who were happened to be in the same location and time the crime happened. Let's use the word crime. Okay. I have a crime and have two suspects that were in the very same area on the same date and the same time that the radio signal was detected. So my hypothesis was comets emit radio emissions in hydrogen line. We have two comets that were in this very same area on the same night Mm -hmm. that the radio signal was detected. And that's what the paper I wrote. I said, hey, we have two candidates. So I'm not saying – I'm a good scientist, so I'm not saying these are it. Right. Because now I have to find the comets, which will be – which will be in the area around 2017 and 2018. We'll analyze those comets and we'll, we'll, we'll see whether or not they were the culprits. Wow. But, you know, we just can't let the mis- – you know, I know people want the mystery to go on. But I'm like, okay, let's see if we can solve this. And if they're not the comets, guess what? We just deduce two possible suspects. Exactly. Yep. You've been to the Skinwalker Ranch and Area 51. Can you comment? Yeah, that's like, you know, I should have mentioned that when you asked me my favorite case. And I totally, that one I forgot about. Skinwalker Ranch is probably one of the most intriguing places I've met, I've been to. Um, I was there with Ryan Skinner. Ryan Skinner is like the, the, I I think he's probably like the most experienced Skinwalker Ranch investigator that's out there. He physically lives like two miles from the ranch. Um, Great guy. And... We went over there with him for about three or four days. We we did see some strange stuff, you know. As a scientist, and as a, and a, I don't want to use the word skeptic. I like to use scientist. Right. Um, we did see some strange stuff. For example, um, I like I like the witness interviews because I can interview house number one, and this guy would say, "Oh my God, I've seen the most craziest stuff the last thirty years: demons, aliens, Bigfoot." <laughs> and then I go next door. To somebody who's been there 40 years, that person's never seen anything. Right. And then I go to the next house. That person's seen all kinds of crap. So we did this where about 50% of the population there has the most craziest stories. And then the other 50% hasn't seen anything. As far as us concerned, we did see some strange stuff. Um, we were all here's – the, here's the, here was the weird part. I don't know if that's a good scientific term. But – as a good investigator, we triple check all our equipment before we went left the hotel. Batteries checked, backup batteries checked, equipment working, everything's good. The second we stepped on the Skinwalker Ranch uh, perimeter, everything was dead. Cameras wouldn't function, batteries were dead, and we were just perplexed. Like, is it the cold? Is it the altitude? What's going on here? You know. We were, we were like, this is crazy. Was any? Did you do any check with the uh, with the geo geographical societies or the geo natural no, services? No, we, we kind of we did some research on if there's been any magnetic anomalies yeah. there or any strange phenomena related mm-hmm. to to, to uh, battery drainage yep. or and we couldn't find anything. But basically, we went back, recharged everything, came back six seven hours later, and everything worked. Hmm. So we were like, okay, that was weird. weird weirdness number one. And then the second one, two of them happened at one night was that we were all standing along the ridge line and we had night vision goggles. We could see really, we had really good military grade night vision, not the cheap ones. And we saw like this massive shadow hover hover over us and we can physically see the shadow like on the ground and through the night vision. And I took them off. And we're all looking up. We could not find the the culprit of this shadow. It was no clouds, perfect day, no aircraft, no trees. Um, and if it was a bird, that was a big bird. We're talking about a shadow probably about 100 feet wide maybe. 
And because it basically covered all of us, it covered our car. And we're like, okay, that is weird. And then the third one was we saw that was a legitimate UFO. We saw a kind of like a light um, turn on real quickly and turn off, basically hovering maybe five, six hundred feet over the ranch. Mm-hmm. That could be anything. That could have been some guy with a drone playing with us and turning on the light. Um, could have been a lot of things, but those three things were pretty cool. I wouldn't say they're amazing, but uh, I do want to go back there again with uh, with Ryan maybe this summer uh, for a few more days. But it's mostly the stories back again, all the weird stories people were telling me. We interviewed the, the, the tribal police. They were telling us crazy stories. We spoke with the county sheriff. They were telling us crazy stories. But uh, we we left and we left there with stories too. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't have any physical evidence. So th- there you go. Three more stories from from a scientist. Antonio, I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's been a great pleasure talking to you. Let our listeners know how they can find out more about you and the work you do, both as a scientist and bo- and as a UFO researcher. Their best bet is um, uh, social media. Uh, I do a lot of tweeting and, mm-hmm. and, and Facebooking. Uh, just look up Antonio Paris. There's only one on Twitter. And I post anything I do about Mars, uh, all, the, all the way from legitimate science to investigating UFOs and any events that I'm at. I tend to tweet those and Facebook those. My website is constantly updated um, with new cases or, um, for example, we're doing some cool Mars research coming up in the spring up in Arizona again. And then uh, local stuff. We do a lot of astronomy outreach out here as well. So if anybody's interested in that in the Tampa Bay area. But, uh, yeah, good talking to you, man. Hey, listen, we'd love to have you back on in the future. Whenever you want, man, just give me a call like you did, and I'll be right back. Nice talk to you. Thanks very much for sharing your day with us. Thank you, sir. Good night now. Exo Nation, my guest this hour was Professor Antonio Paris. A couple of websites, planetary-science.org and aerial-phenomenon.org. I'll be back on the other side of this commercial break with the news as we continue here in the Exo from our broadcast center. We're right here in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. The Exxon is truly a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. And we come to you Monday through Friday from 8 p.m. Eastern until midnight on the Exxon Broadcast Network, Talkstar Radio Network, and Radio X. My name is Rob McConnell. I'll be back on the other side of this break. Don't go away. <laughs> 